The next item on our agenda is our public forum. This is the time where citizens are invited to address the school board on any matter of concern about the school division. We have received, in essence, over 500 um, comments um, via um, our internet, and those comments are in board docs for those persons that were unable to physically be present in the building but have sent our, the comments. We have been, we've received them and we have read them. Citizens have signed up in advance. Speakers will be given two minutes to address the school board and we will follow the sign up list. We ask that each speaker come to the microphone and clearly state your name and neighborhood or school affiliation. To assist you in tracking your time, there is a timekeeping system on the podium. The light will be green as you begin your remarks. The yellow light means you have one minute remaining. And we ask that you stop speaking when the light turns red. The school board is here today to hear from you. The community speakers should speak directly to the board. Unfortunately, we will not be responding to the speakers, but we do appreciate your attendance here this afternoon and as always providing your input. I will announce um, the first uh, two to three speakers, we ask that you'll be prepared to speak um, as your names are called. The first person that we will receive comments from is Ms. Desiree Hopkins. Um, next, Mr. Derek Harold. Ms. Hopkins. There, there's speakers, please, in the rear of the building, not the front, there's a podium. Hmm. Oh. I'm sorry, please forgive me. Ms. Hopkins, before you speak, um, Mr. Um, Harold, will you be prepared to speak at the front podium? No. no. On the One back, on the that's right. Side. Okay, good, thank you. In the back, please, we're, we're gonna, um, two at a time, we're gonna alternate the two back mics. Please be prepared on that mic and we go to the other side. Ms. Hopkins. My name is Desiree Hopkins and I am a librarian at Moody Middle School. I am also an HCFPS parent with a daughter of Pocahontas and a son at Godwin. I am here speaking on behalf of a large group of HCPS teachers who feel that the only safe way to start our school year is 100% virtual learning. About two and a half weeks ago, I was online discussing how schools could open in local Henrico Facebook groups. In these groups, I continuously found myself debating with people who didn't think COVID was real or thought teachers didn't want to go back to school because they were lazy. I ended up creating a Facebook group called HCPS Back to School Safely. I wanted a safe place for people in the community to have a meaningful and respectful conversation about education in this pandemic. In less than two weeks, we have had over 3,700 members join our concerned community. Most of them are HCPS employees from teachers to bus drivers and parents to grandparents. We started a petition asking for a virtual and safe opening, which, ha which the board has received, and now has over 1,100 signatures and over 450 additional concerns. We also received over 500 thank yous in just two days to send to Dr. Cashwell for her support. Currently, HCPS does not have a clear plan to implement a safe in-person school experience. When staff and families have raised specific concerns, the answer understandably, is always some form of, we don't have every detail worked out yet. We believe the reason you don't have the answers is because the answers just don't exist yet. There is simply no feasible way to safely return to school under our current conditions. Staff and students will get sick, some will have long-term disabilities as a result, and some will die. We reject that outcome. I speak for teachers who are researching, reading, and listening to scientific data that evolves almost daily. We are watching as our nation fails to act as the cohesive protective unit that we all started in March when we worked together to flatten the curve. At this time, the data is unclear about the risk and dangers for children who become infected, but it is crystal clear Ms. that Hopkins, it's Ms. Hopkins, thank you so much. I apologize, but your time is up. 
please look up front there the, the 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 timers up front on the podium um, red yellow and green so as you speak please um, be cognizant of those two um, before you speak mr. Hurl do we have Jessica Ortiz Ms. Ortiz are you here if not we're gonna to move to Sarah Johnson Ms. Johnson are you here if so yes ma'am please take that that mic yes ma'am thank you so much mr. Hurl your, the floor is yours sir Good afternoon, Dr. Cashwell and esteemed members of the board. My name is Derek Carroll, and I'm a sectional education teacher here in Harrico County and a parent in the Three Chop District. Ms. Hill, can you move a little closer, speak Sorry. a little louder. Thank you, sir. I'm here to, today to give my views and concerns on the current school reopening vote. Today, as of today, I'm 100% in favor of opening virtually as a parent and as a sectional education teacher. As a parent, my concerns of opening schools are not safe at this time with the unknowns of COVID. Protecting the well-being of my child, I'm terrified. I'm terrified of what could happen as he attends if he attends in person as an African American parent and being disproportionately affected by this virus and having underlying health condition puts my family at a greater risk. The concerns I have as a teacher are PPE for all. It's unavailable at this time. We do not know when it's going to be available. Meeting the CDC health department recommendations. Being in rooms with unmatched students during lunches as a teacher, having more to move through multiple classrooms and exponentially increasing my chances of becoming infected as a special education teacher that teaches collaboratively, affecting my job where I won't be able to get close to students as I used to be able to and be able to provide the, the um, necessary help. Virtual learning can be engaging. Yesterday, my son took part in a mock virtual school day sponsored by Kathy Wood of Echo Lake Elementary. My son has severe attention issues. He was able to stay engaged. It can work. I think worth, it's worth exploring. Keeping virtual learning open until the end of the semester so the district can take the time to actually figure out COVID, fix buildings, procure supplies, and implement the necessary safeguards to get our students back to school full time. This also can be an opportunity to get help for families that have difficulties with childcare work schedules and not having flexibility to have their students with virtual work. We are all in this together. We cannot make it back safely at this time, but we can make the necessary efforts to find ways to help families no matter what their situation. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Harold. I appreciate that, sir. Um, before you speak, Ms. Johnson, Mr. Lincoln, Jimmy Lincoln, will you please take the mic? Thank you, Mr. Lincoln. Ms. Johnson. My name is Sarah Johnson. I am a pediatric nurse and the mother of three children in the Tuckahoe District. Thank you, members of the school board, for your tireless work. And thank you, Dr. Cashwell, for choosing the safer virtual path forward. Individually, we are at different levels in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but collectively, we are near the bottom at the level of safety. The virtual path is key to addressing this first. It protects students, teachers, staff, and the extended community from viral spread. It will also buy us time to thoughtfully allocate resources, implement appropriate safety measures, and to learn more about COVID-19. Now is also the time to shift the conversation toward vulnerable communities who rely on our school system for some of their most basic needs. Feedback from local immigration organizations and community leaders highlight the following. Food insecurity, lack of affordable childcare, lack of internet access and laptops, language barriers, fear of punitive measures if students are unable to log into school when necessary. And of course, we know that black and brown communities are at a higher risk of contracting COVID-19 and suffering worse outcomes. I know you have looked at the data and listened to the community's concerns. I know you will continue to look at different angles to this crisis and will be innovative and creative with this new platform. But we, as business leaders, community organizers, religious organizations, stay-at-home parents and volunteers, have to partner with each other to make sure the rug is not pulled out from underneath those who rely on in-person school the most. Through partnership, we have the opportunity to model for our children how to prioritize needs over wants. Perhaps a crash course in civics in real time is the best lesson we can offer our students this fall. I urge you to vote for an equitable virtual option. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. Before you speak, Mr. Lincoln, um, Kevin Miller, Mr. Lip Miller. Mr. Miller, if you'd be so kind, take that mic over there, sir. Thank you so much. Mr. Lincoln, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, good afternoon, y'all. I'm a parent of two Henrico County students. I'm a teacher as well at Verina High School, Go Blue Devils. That's for you, Ms. Atkins, especially. And I'm here to speak about the forest and not let y'all get distracted by the trees. 
I could talk about how the data on COVID is constantly evolving and how it's trending in a negative direction and how the situation today is much worse than it was a month ago or even in March. I could talk about how none of the HCPS teachers in this county are excited about virtual learning, but how they value their students' lives and the families' lives above all else. We could talk about how the CDC guidelines that would have to be followed are for a variety of reasons impossible for any public school to follow. We could talk about how this disease is disproportionately devastating our black and Latinx families. We could talk about the very real childcare concerns that many people who wear a color different than me might have today. And we could talk about how the community is gonna to come together to address those concerns. We could talk about how those who would seek to place individual liberty above the needs of a community in the midst of a public health crisis perhaps have misunderstood what liberty really and truly means and how with that liberty comes a great deal of responsibility. We could talk about all of those trees and we could talk for days and hours and we would make some very good points. But I'm not here to talk about trees. I'm here to talk about the entire forest. I'm here to ask everyone in this room a simple question. Which one? Which teacher? Which instructional assistant? Which father? Which auntie? Which neighbor who isn't really a blood relative but is an aunt because they watch the children after school every day? Which custodial member? Which member of our food service staff? Which brother? Which sister? Which cousin? Which student? I want to know which life we are willing to sacrifice. Ms. Lincoln, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. All. Yes, sir. Mr. Miller, before you speak, next we'll have Ms. Julie Stribling. Ms. Stribling, if you could, thank you so much. Mr. Miller, floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Appreciate the opportunity to speak. My name is Kevin Miller. I have two children in the Tuckahoe uh, Elementary School in Henrico County. Uh, I grew up in Virginia Beach, went to public schools. My wife is a product of public schools, and we greatly value the public school education. And ultimately, we want the same thing for our kids. Uh, clearly, from the previous uh, speech, this is a very emotional time. And what we're here to ask for is simply give everyone the choice to make the individual situation that best fits their family needs. There are thousands and thousands of individual stories, lots of emotional stories. Uh, we all understand that. But to try to fit everyone into one simple category is going to end up doing more harm than it will actually do good. We ask that you clearly define what the data is that you're making your decisions about and follow the data so that we all know the rules of the game. It's been a very confusing time for all. You have a very difficult decision to make and you've had a lot on your plate through the last four, five, six weeks. We understand that emotions are running high. That's why all of us are here to speak on behalf of our individual situations. We understand that people may be afraid or may have circumstances that do not deem it safe for their kid, child, guardian, et cetera, to be in school. They deserve that choice. But for those who need the value of education, like all of us, everyone should be able to get that choice to send their kids back to school. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Miller. Um, Kristen Taylor, if you could take that mic. Ms. Taylor, thank you so much. Ms. Stribling, the floor is yours. Okay. I'm Julie Stribling. I have four kids, three Henrico County students in second, fourth, and sixth grade in the Tuckahoe District. For those families and teachers who are afraid to send kids to school, you should have the choice to stay home. In Henrico County, it appears you have a virtual schedule for those constituents. But for those parents and teachers who want the choice to have children in person at school, why can't we have that option? Seems like you could make everyone happy quite simply, unless there's another agenda. Many parents patiently accepted the school closures last spring, but now with the American Pediatrics Association endorsement, many realize the harm of keeping kids out of school far outweighs returning them. Please think about this for a second. Private schools in Henrico and Richmond are opening up five days a week in person. For the majority of us in Henrico who cannot afford private school and want our kids back, we're truly creating the haves and have-nots. As for virtual learning, I tried. I tried hard and I failed. I have three girls under the age of 10 on three different levels. Managing their education using one computer was impossible, especially with a toddler in the background. I feel for all working parents, especially single parents and working moms, who have to decide whether to provide for their families or help their kids learn at home. 
What an impossible choice. Please don't suggest virtual instruction is a good substitute for in-class learning. If it is, couldn't we just mass produce pre-recorded videos and worksheets to complete at home and not have teachers? I pray not. A local public school teacher told me recently she had on average three third graders attend her Zoom sessions in the spring. She also feared some of them were babysitting their younger siblings. Just because we build it does not mean they will come. Two of my daughter's teachers told me they became teachers because they love children. They are frustrated with their ability to gauge with them online. From your staff survey, 91% of the staff you asked said yes, they would sign their contract to return in the fall. Sounds like a very willing workforce ready to serve our children, the Henrico teachers I know. Let me leave with you with this. One month ago, a nurse friend reached out about a really bad day she had. Her terminally ill patient came in for his last June treatment. His 16-year-old child had just committed suicide. Ms. They Ridley. think the abrupt change in isolation contributed. Thank you, Ms. Ridley. Thank, Thank you, you so time. much. Yes, ma'am. Um, Ms. Taylor, before you begin, um, is Bridget Morris present? Ms. Morris, Bridget Morris, Bridget Morris. Next, uh, Yao Levin, if you could take that mic in the back. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ms. Taylor. Good afternoon. My name is Kristen Trailer from the Tuckahoe District. This whole situation is out of control. There are teachers protesting, people dressing up like the Grim Reaper, grown adults posting extremely nasty comments on social media, families creating pods and hiring private teachers, and just general unrest and confusion. I think this could have been avoided. Early on, the school district should have come out and just said, there'll be a choice, full in-person return or virtual. Then it could have gathered a group of stakeholders from around the county to form groups, one for virtual learning and one for in-person learning. They could have come up with general guidelines for, with various options for the schools to consider. Then the guidelines could have been passed down to each school principal. The principal for each school could have put together a group of teachers, administrators, staff, parents, and even children at the middle school and high school levels to come together to create a plan for their particular school. Each school is very different, and a one-size-fits-all plan in this situation just doesn't make sense. Instead, everyone could work together to evaluate the space availability, transportation needs, and other school particularities, brainstorming solutions on how to bring everyone who chooses to return back in the safest way possible. Since those stakeholders would be the ones developing and implementing the plan, they would own it. Those plans could be presented now, and then we could be discussing them right now, and people could be evaluating which one they want to choose. And then the focus could shift to preparing for return. I believe there's still time to make all this happen, starting today with your vote. The uncertainty and anxiety people are feeling over this very important issue have taken on a life of its own. We've wasted these past two months over arguing over virtual versus in-person. We've lost sight of the main goal, providing the best education possible for our children. Great leaders know how to bring people together in a crisis to collaborate on creative solutions. That's what we need from this board, leadership. Ms. Trailer, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, before you speak, Ms. Levin, um, Tamara former Peg. Ms. Peg, thank you so much. Okay. Ms. Levin. Good afternoon, Chairman, school board members, and Dr. Cashwell. Education is essential. Without a strong and equitable public education, the wealth and achievement gaps will continue to grow especially if you opt for the virtual only model. The goal of the shutdown was never to eradicate the virus. It was to flatten the curve as to not overwhelm hospitals and healthcare workers. That goal has been achieved. We now know the strategies needed to mitigate exposure and spread. While there is no doubt that we are facing an unprecedented time and significant health risk, COVID cases in 19 year olds and younger account for under 11% of cases in Virginia. Under two of those, 2% 2 of those resulted in hospitalizations with zero deaths. At the same time, approximately 1,000 daycares have remained open in Virginia, and there have been no outbreaks from daycare centers in Henrico. Let us learn from daycares how to reopen schools effectively and safely mitigate the transmission of COVID outbreaks. Private schools are reopening five days a week this fall. We are failing Virginia's children by not fully re reopening the doors of our public schools, especially minority, low-income, rural students, and students with special needs. The reopening of schools should provide parents and teachers with a choice. Students who want or need a virtual path should be able to get it. Teachers who need a virtual path should be accommodated. Parents who want five days face-to-face -face instruction should get that choice as they do in Hanover, Goochland, Hampton City, 
Colonial Heights, and other localities. Education is essential. Teachers are not babysitters. They are educators, and education is about so much more than just academics. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ms. Levin. Um, Ms. Pegg, before you begin, um, Millie Denacourt. Ms. Denacourt, are you here? Millie Denacourt, are you here? Next, Mark Levin. Mr. Levin, are you here? Or Levine, Mark, Mr. Levine? Okay, yes, sir. Take that mic. Thank you, sir. Madam, you can begin. Hi, thank you. I'm Tam Corner of a, a Free Chop District. Um, I was just, I think there's a theme here of what we would like to see. With can you move just a little closer? Thank you, ma'am. It's just virtual, and that is just a, the choice. Um, no one's saying that we feel, um, you know, the concerns are not valid or anything like that. We just, we really think there's a choice because there's not one type of learning for everyone. So our families just really need the choice and we really would like you to hear that and listen to that for us. Um, and we feel that guidelines have been set up for, for that and that we can do that. And if we all work together and stop, you know, arguing and fighting with each other and, um, and just using the word safe, it's kind of broad, doesn't really put real things out there. So it's kind of real hard to understand what that means when you just throw that word out there. But um, so just, I, I just think we all just, we, we just really want the choice. I think that's what we're all trying to say, say here today. So. Thank you so much, Madam. Um, Angela McKay, Ms. McKay. Thank you, Ms. McKay. You may begin, sir. My name is Mark Levine. I have about, probably about 180 kids that go to Henrico schools, because I'm a bus driver. I've been a bus driver since 2010. I love my job. I hate it when I have to call in because I'm sick or because my daughter, I need to take her to the hospital for whatever reason. Or I have to miss work. I hate it. I despise it. I love going to my job. This is the first job I've ever had that I love going to. I want to go back to work. A lot of drivers that I've talked to want to go back to work. We're scared that we're going to get furloughed and can't afford it. This is the only job that we have. But I ask, when y'all leave today, wear your mask correctly. Don't cut on your AC in, the, in your car. Cut on the heat or roll your window down, or leave it up. See how hot it is in your car to feel how hot it is on a bus. Because we don't have AC on a bus, even on a special need bus. They have climate control. It's still hot. I've been on special need buses with climate control. It's still humid hot, but it is a little bit cooler on those buses. I say, Yes, I do want to go back to work. Some of my fellow bus drivers and assistants want to go back to work, but we want to go back safely. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And thank you for all that you do. Um, before you begin, Ms. McKay, Anita Hoekstra, Ms. Hoekstra, if you could take the mic to my, le my left. Thank you so much, Ms. Hoekstra. Madam, you can begin. Thank you. My name is Angela McKay. I'm in the Tuckahoe District. As the mother of three HCPS students, I'm incredibly invested in these discussions. In these unprecedented times, it's imperative that we make wise, data-driven decisions and not act out of fear and anxiety. At this stage of the pandemic, the data show that children are statistically the lowest risk group for contracting and spreading COVID-19. We also have seen that daycare centers throughout Henrico that have remained open have not had outbreaks. In addition, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends returning students physically to school for many reasons, not the least of which are the physical safety and social emotional well-being of students. The recommendation for virtual only learning for the first nine weeks will fail our children yet again. The proposed schedule would place students in front of a computer screen for over four hours each day, which is well above the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines. Too much time in front of screens puts children at greater risk of obesity and they tend to sleep fewer minutes per night according to the AAP. Even as a temporary stopgap, virtual learning has severe limitations. Students with attention difficulties will struggle to stay on track and students who are not apt to speak up in a normal classroom setting will withdraw even further. 
There is no replacement for in-person instruction. Even the best virtual curriculum will not be a fraction as effective as in-person instruction. I implore you to offer parents the choice of a full five-day return to school for students. All Henrico County students deserve the best education we have to offer, and that is an in-person, in-classroom learning experience face-to-face -face with their teachers. We are fortunate to have world-class teachers who are dedicated to their students. Let us give them the opportunity to shine and rebuild their students. Thank you for your support. Thank you so much, Madam. Um, before you speak, Ms. Hochstra, Aiden Sheldon, Aiden, if you could take the mic back to my right, that'd be great. Thank you, sir. Madam? So I'm gonna start with a story. A story about me. I was raised in a poverty-stricken home. My mom worked two to three jobs to pay rent. My father was an alcoholic. We lived, off, we lived off government welfare and included housing assistance, food stamps, and WIC. Good teachers, good coaches, and friends changed the trajectory of my life. Um, my, my gym teacher encouraged me to join cross country. I subsequently was able to get on college on a running scholarship. Um, choosing 100% virtual is choosing isolation for the children who are at risk. The children that are in welfare, the children that are in poverty, um, it's only going to widen the educational and achievement gap. It's going to take away all of these support systems and opportunities for thousands of children that need them most. Um, I have a rising kindergartner and second grader. I can't understand how virtual learning would work for these ages. My son loses interest in a Disney movie or a Pixar movie. Um, how is he going to maintain focus for four to five hours a day? In addition, the AAP guidelines recommend one hour of screen time per day for five-year-olds. Are we going to be able to meet those guidelines as well as provide a good virtual education? Virtual schools are not a new concept. They've been around for decades um, with the internet, but the data is not good and the outcomes aren't as good. And more children drop out and don't do as well in reading and math. Um, virtual schools will only work if children have support. Parents are deemed learning coaches. I will be at work. I will not be at home. I will not be able to be a learning coach. Um, how many children in Henrico will have learning coaches? What about the parents that are working, the single parents, or the parents who maybe just don't have that much interest in education? Without the support, the children will fail. Another half year of instruction loss will be impossible to make up. <clears throat> There's a lot of conversation about fear with COVID-19, and right now we're talking about closing based on fear, but not based on the data. Scientific evidence- Madam, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Before you begin, Aiden Liam Sheldon, if I said that right, thank you. Okay, Aiden, you can begin, sir. Good afternoon, school board members. My name is Aiden Sheldon. I'm a rising sixth grader and I'm going to Hungry Creek Middle School. I've been looking forward to middle school for a while now. My experience and many others, probably, online classes don't work nearly as well as they did in person. I got a lot less done and we can't interact with our teachers nearly as well. To have, a success, uh, to have a successful education, you need to be able to interact with your teachers and classmates. What about PE? Kids need, kids need activity if they want to succeed in school. What about kids that don't have an adult at home with them? A lot of kids are not old enough to stay at home. It's very sad that people are dying from this. My own grandma died in February. But those who aren't at risk or don't have someone in their household at risk should be able to go back to school if they opt for that option. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening to me. Liam, before you begin, give me one second if you could. Is, is Ms. Jessica Delk here? Ms. Delk, are you here? Ms. Delk, are you here? Hello, I'm a rising eighth grader at Hungary Creek Middle School. Please give us an option to go to school full time. It helps kids learn effectively and people my age, unless they have a health, co health condition or not at risk. I think there should be a rule that if you get sick, you can't go to school to protect the teachers and staff. Also, maybe the bell schedule can be more spread out and have 80 minute classes for more spread out bed bell schedule. And maybe the teachers that are at risk or teachers if you don't want to, won't go out the hall during transitions. Most cases in Henrico don't affect kids and 65% of deaths are from nursing homes. 
although we do feel very bad for the elderly in nursing homes that have gotten sick and died. I have asthma and would still go to school. I think there should be an option for virtual only that maybe the at-risk teachers can do instead of coming to school. Maybe two to four teachers per subject, depending on how many students can't go to school due to a health condition or someone in their um, household is at risk or elderly and they could teach vir virtually. Since this is at my school, I think it's at other schools, some rooms have like foldable walls that you can like push open that could make bigger classrooms for more spread out. And we can't let a virus run our lives. We have to protect the most vulnerable while still going to school. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Rachel Harrell, Ms. Harrell, are you here? Rachel Harrell. Melissa McPherson, Ms. McPherson. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you guys so much for the opportunity to be here today and to speak on behalf of our kids. My name is Gordon Morano. I'm a local physician. I've been a resident in Rico County for over 10 years. Uh, for myself and many others. Excuse me one sec. Um, I think uh, Ms. Jessica Delk was in your place. I don't have you written. He's not up to speak, but he's actually taking Mel Davis and Aaron White's spot. Um, in the wrong spot. What, 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 excuse me. Hold on one second. Uh, we, we're going by speakers who signed up. Well, I'm calling the names um, that we have, the, the names. Um, so it was Jessica Delk. And I don't. I, I are you Ms. Delk? Are you, only signed up. Are you Ms. Delk? So you're, you're saying you're giving him your spot? Okay, oh, shh, give me one second. Let me just say this. Um, the, the challenge is the precedence. This, we have a process set that we have to follow in which we ask persons to sign up. And so um, there are so many more who could not sign up that weren't able to speak. So I don't want to vary from that as far as changing. So Ms. Delka, would you like to say something? Because you can. Ms. Delka, OK. So I have three kids at Teco Elementary and Teco Middle. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner. I don't get a choice to go to work every day. Um, throughout this entire pandemic, I have gone to work. I have not complained. I've figured out childcare, but that can't be a long-term solution. There are many of us who don't have a choice. I've left my 11-year-old at home with my children, my nine-year-old at home with my six-year-old. This is not gonna work. Teachers are their number one reporters of child physical sexual abuse. And to think that these kids are not going to be heard or seen, a lot of these teachers, I don't know if you pulled in the survey, did, they, did you find out if they had a vast majority of their students that they saw on Zoom? Because I think you'd find that number was very low. Um, so I do fear that this decision is a very hard one for you, but there are a lot of factors to take into consideration. A vaccine is not gonna be available for a very long time and will certainly not be available for children for a very long time. So I thank you for your hard decision tonight, but you need to, Think about those impoverished children, working families, and anyone where virtual education is not going to work. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Elk. Mr. David Mullenfield. Mr. Mullenfield, are you here? Thank you, sir. You may take this podium. Madam, you can begin. If you state your, is, state your name, please. My name is Melissa McPherson. I live in the Three Chop District. I have a daughter who is in the leadership school at Freeman and a son at Pocahontas Middle. I'm a single working mother and a small local business owner. As such, I'd like to tell you about the harm that I've seen firsthand as a result of keeping schools closed. Locally and nationally, it seems our singular focus on COVID has blinded us to the overall societal harm, including school closures, that our policies to address COVID are causing. I'm not a healthcare professional, so I can't stand here and provide you with an expert opinion on healthcare issues. But over these past few months, 
I've personally dealt with and seen the following. In the spring, my children struggled academically and emotionally as a result of their lack of access to teachers, peers, and school activities. All of us can attest to how much more there is to school than just an education. There are relationships and interactions that are critical to us as human beings that promote learning. My employees are literally in tears as they attempt to figure out how they are going to balance work with the increased costs associated with education, transportation, activities, and tutoring. And make no mistake, there is an increased cost. These pressures adversely affect their home life and threaten to spill over into their professional life. Everyone in this room knows that keeping schools closed only furthers the divide between the haves and the have-nots. People with means are hiring tutors, creating educational co-ops, and providing other methods to ensure that their children are receiving what they need. Yet there are thousands of people, including some of my employees, who are literally having to choose between ensuring that their children receive a proper education and their jobs. This week, Harvard School of Public Ms. McPherson, Health can I stop you for a minute? Can you put your mask back on, please? Oh, sorry. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. It's fogging up my mask. I apologize. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> This week, Harvard School of Public Health made clear its view that children should attend school in person because the overall harm caused by remote learning far outweighs the risks from COVID. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mary Carlson, Ms. Carlson, just wait one second, let them wipe that mic down. You can go stand at it, but they're gonna wipe it down before you speak. Thank you so much, Ms. Carlson. Mr. Mulville. Thank you for my two minutes. Can you come a little closer, sir? Thank you for my two minutes. You'll probably be glad when they're up. I have four children in Henrico Public Schools. The oldest is 15. The youngest is five. They love their schools, they love their teachers, and they want to go back in person. And I want them to go back in person. And so does the CDC. And so does the American Academy of Pediatrics, and so does the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Mathematics, and Medicine, I'm sorry. But the superintendent does not want them to go back. The superintendent is concerned for the health of our children. So her recommendation is for my five-year-old and seven-year-old daughters to sit in front of a computer screen for five hours a day, and for my older children to sit and stare at a computer screen for eight hours a day. Can the superintendent produce one doctor, a medical doctor, or one scientist who will say that that is a recipe for health? I suspect she cannot, because that's not healthy, and that's not school. Six months ago, we would have called that borderline child abuse. Not to mention, this is a waste of community funds. Because if we're going to go 100% online, why are we paying teacher salaries to replicate what Khan Academy and many other providers already do online for free? The schools need to open for real. They need to open with precautions, with masks, with social distancing, with all the recommendations and with caveats for at-risk teachers or families, but they need to open. And the superintendent and anyone who thinks it is okay Mr. to Mulfield. recommend kindergartners stare at a screen for five hours need to reevaluate their career choices. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Richard Sullivan, is Richard Sullivan here, Ms. Sullivan? Yes, sir. You may begin, madam. and I am a parent of a rising fifth grader at the Tuckahoe District at Carver Elementary. I first want to thank all of you for your service. I think my daughter is blessed to be attending this wonderful school district and I do not envy the position you are in to make this very difficult decision. Can you move just a little closer? Thank you. I just want to say I don't envy the position that you are in to make this very difficult decision. I know there's a lot of opinions and differences expressed in this room and I think they all have valid points. I'm here to advocate today to give us the option for those of us, for the teachers, for the parents that would like our kids to return to school 
to be given that option. I grew up in public schools my whole life. I was a military child. I've moved around. I only missed nine days of school in 1989 when our teachers had to walk off and strike. And I remember as a fifth grade girl watching my teacher protest just for better benefits and better salaries. And that was nine days. And that still stays in my mind. And I certainly don't want our teachers to feel that those of us parents who are advocating for the option to return to school that we don't value you. That is definitely not the case. You are essential to our kids' future. That teacher in my past, who was even just striking for better benefits, okay, was a huge influence in my life. So I just wanted to say that first. <clears throat> my husband and I, we are a two-person working family. We are both essential workers. We are fortunate to have childcare for our child at a childcare center, but that does stretch a budget thin. It is pretty close to a mortgage payment, what we pay. And speaking to the director of our child care center this morning about the possibility of virtual only learning coming, we were told that they cannot guarantee all kids are going to be able to have proper Wi-Fi access just because of the number of elementary age students that attend the child care center. And as I've been told, the hot spots that are available uh, right now are being given. Ms. Carson, thank you so much. Next, um, Dr. Shep Morano. Dr. Morano, are you present? That, that, that might, so he does get to speak. <laughs> so you may begin. Hi, my name is Richard Sullivan. I'm a firefighter and a paramedic here in the county. Um, I also work as a transport medic for a local company. Um, I've been in contact <clears throat> with over 20 COVID patients and have yet because of wearing a mask and proper PE, come down. I have not come down with COVID. The CDC website shows that over 50% of all um, adults, well, population in the US, um, who come in contact with the COVID virus show little to no symptoms at all. Another 30% show very mild symptoms. We want to have the ability to send our kids to school. We have four children. My wife and I are both frontline workers. And staying home is not an option. I understand that Ms. Cash well says that science backs her decision. I don't know where she's getting her facts from, because I've read nowhere, nowhere, that science is supporting her facts to send our kids to online virtual learning. As a matter of fact, the CDC director said he would absolutely send his grandchildren to school. And he's the one who is outlining what we should be doing in the country. If it's good enough for his grandchildren, it's obviously good enough for ours. We've led, Henrico County has been the leader for years. Let's not fall behind. Um, this isn't the city, no offense. If I wanted to live there, I would have moved there. I've been a Henrico County resident for 22 years, and <clears throat> I would greatly appreciate it if you would give us the option to send our kids to school. Thank you so much, sir. Um, Ms. Suters, Christine Suters. I, thank you so much. Dr. Moreno? Okay, thank you so much for letting me come and talk today. My name is Shep Morano. I'm a local physician. I've been a resident of Enrico County in the Tucco District for over 10 years. Um, for myself and many people that I know watching helplessly as our children's lives have been totally upended by social and educational disruption and isolation has really been the hardest part of the whole pandemic by far. The one demographic group, our kids, that has essentially zero significant risk from COVID-19 has suffered and will suffer far more than any other group. This is the reason why I'm here today. And you should know that my kids are actually not enrolled in the Henrico County Public School System, but I'm here because I believe in this. Um, I could talk to you about the numbers all day long, but in the interest of time, I won't. I'll just reiterate what my, many other folks have said here today, that there is absolutely no scientific or medical data that supports keeping kids out of schools. That's clear, there's no argument there. Um, for our teachers and educators, we're incredibly thankful for your hard work and everything that you have done. Um, that's definitive. But we can't ignore the obvious. Virtual and online education simply isn't the same thing as having kids in school, and it never will be. The benefits to our children from being in school with their peers go far beyond book learning. 
And we all understand this. We can't continue to deny them this, and we cannot let our children be victimized by a failure to plan effectively to get kids back into school. Lastly, much has been said recently about social and economic injustice. Nowhere in society is this going to be more openly visible than in our educational system. By keeping our kids out of public schools, we're forcing them to suffer and fall behind while their wealthier, more advanced peers and advantaged peers have better access to superior learning and social environments. This widening educational gap will have significant ramifications for our underprivileged children for years to come. Our Constitution requires that all kids be given <clears throat> equal educational opportunity regardless of circumstances. Our children's social and emotional development are at stake and must be protected at all costs. Virtual learning is only effective for children with access to a stable environment with strong familial and social support. Dr. Bueno, thank you so much for, for sharing with us, sir. I really appreciate that. We appreciate that. Um, Ms. Ms. Hyatt, Megan Hyatt, are you here, Ms. Hyatt? Thank you, Ms. Hyatt. Ms. Suters? Good afternoon, my name is Christine Suters. I teach at Hermitage High School and I will have two girls that in a few years will attend Ward Elementary School. Um, board, I do not envy you. As you can see, this is an emotional issue and I so appreciate your leadership and the phone calls and all of the emails that you've exchanged with everyone in this room. I'm here to urge the board to support online learning at least for the first nine weeks for one reason. People in here are talking about safety, about following protocols. We cannot even as adults, follow those protocols. We cannot wear masks correctly. We cannot social distance. It is inappropriate and not developmentally sound to ask our children to wear masks for eight hours a day, to socially distance, and to do all of these other things we cannot as adults do. My focus today is on explaining why we cannot do this in schools. And I hear that parents want to give the choice, but the problem is that the choice to go back into school is not safe because we cannot appropriately provide PPE and ensure the health and safety of the staff and the students and their families. Have you been in a school recently? I know most of us have. Most of us are parents. Do our kids follow every rule all the time consistently? I don't think so. I think if we're honest, we know that that's not possible. The issue is that normally failing to follow directions wouldn't be a big deal. It would just be a minor discipline issue now, a matter of not wearing a mask or not socially distancing could be life or death. So in closing, I urge the board to please support online learning. We're in this together. Let's make it out alive and healthy. Thank you. Janet Turner, Ms. Turner, are you present? Ms. Turner, Janet Turner, Janet Turner. Alicia Sullivan, Ms. Sullivan, are you here? Ms. Sullivan, are you here? Andrew Thompson, Mr. Thompson, are you here? Ms. Lamb, Ms. Elizabeth Lamb. Ms. Lamb, are you here? Thank you, Ms. Lamb. Ms. Hyatt. Dear esteemed members of the board, my name is Megan Hyatt and I am a VHS graduate and an academic integrated services teacher at Gaten Elementary. I have worked for HCPS for seven out of the nine years of my teaching. My classroom has some unique features to it. I can have students for six years in my K-5 classroom. When I introduce myself to families, I tell them, sorry, you're stuck with me. We're family now. I stand here today to advocate for one of the most vulnerable populations in HCPS, our students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Although my students benefit most from in-person instruction, at this juncture, in-person instruction is not what is best for them. A study from May in the Disability and Health Journal states, people with developmental disabilities 17 or younger had a 1.6% fatality rate as compared to people of the same age who had a 0.01% fatality rate. 1.6%. By my very conservative estimates, there are about 500 students in Henrico with ID and DD. 1.6% of that number is eight. Eight who could die in HCPS. Eight funerals of children we could be attending. Many of my students have comorbidities that put them at a greater risk of fatality from COVID-19. This is coupled with a 23% higher chance of contracting COVID because they are less likely to wear a mask or understand social distancing. It just won't work. I, like all teachers, want to go to get back to in-person instruction, but we aren't ready. New data comes out daily, changing our previous understandings. In Virginia, our numbers have not consistently decreased. 
We should err on the side of health and safety, mitigate risks, and not gamble with people's lives. We need to see a 24 consecutive day decrease of COVID cases before returning to in-school instruction. Therefore, please choose online schooling for the first nine weeks. Let's use this time to create better virtual schooling and collaborate with community partners to support our families in need most. To quote one of my dear friends and colleagues, Samantha Yearout, some of our students already have a shortened life expectancy. Why would we risk shortening that anymore? Thank you so much. Alan Krukashanks, Mr. Krukashanks, thank you, sir. Madam, you may begin. I'm Elizabeth Lamb. My son should be attending kindergarten next year at Knuckles Farm Elementary, but that's really up to you all. I'm here to ask for the choice to do what is best for my child. You have made it clear that parents and teachers who do not want to return to the classroom can choose the virtual option. Parents and teachers who do want to return to classroom learning should have that choice five days a week. In recent months, we've been hearing a lot about equality, science, and medical expertise. Mandatory virtual learning for all students will only increase the disparities that already exist between upper and lower income families, which will have a disproportionate detrimental effect on minorities. There is an educational arms race going on right now to secure in-home teachers and tutors, and that will only leave disadvantaged children further behind. A vote for virtual learning only is a vote against equality. The American Academy of Pediatrics strongly advocates that children be physically present in classrooms in order to safeguard their intellectual development emotional well-being, and in some cases, physical safety. Science tells us that child to adult transmission of COVID-19 is rare. A vote for virtual learning is a vote against science. A popular counter argument to all of this is that people will die if we return to the classroom. That's right, they'll die from school shootings and they'll die from the flu, both of which are far deadlier threats than COVID-19. And let us not forget that people are dying because malls and restaurants are open too. And do not delude yourself into thinking that if you keep the schools closed, that children will not suffer and die. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Harry Dell, Mr. Dell, are you present? Good afternoon. My name is Alan Crookshanks. I'm a parent of three students uh, in RICO, and I'm here to encourage you that our default position as a school board, as a community, should be to get kids back in school. I don't think anybody here would argue that there won't be exceptions. But instead of condemning the vast majority of our students to a clearly inferior education, let's focus time and resources on protecting those who most need help. Practically speaking, as you heard from many folks today, my own family's experience is, at best, virtual learning is a challenge. At best, sitting kids in front of a computer for four to six hours a day is not an education, it's not healthy. Morally speaking, you know, we have working families, single parents, disadvantaged families. How can you condemn them to a choice, an impossible choice of, do I work to support my child? Do I leave them at home? How can you make them to force, that, force them to make that choice? From a community perspective, Henrico's own survey of all the options they presented for potentially going back to school earlier this year, 16% of families supported virtual learning. 84% supported some form of in-person learning. That's a pretty clear community mandate. And finally, scientifically, just since that survey has come out, as you've heard from others, AAP, Director of the CDC, Institute Pasteur, I encourage you to look at the Boston Globe, Wall Street Journal. There have been numerous in-depth analysis of this saying students should be going back to school. So practically, morally, scientifically, I firmly believe students should be going back to school as their default. And again, clearly there will be exceptions, but let's default to getting kids back in school. So I ask you today, when you come to make a decision, choose not based off fear. Choose based off science, data, logic. Focus on the information that's out there. And let's give folks a choice. Let's try to get kids back in school. And if we need to make exceptions, great. But first and foremost, let's make the best choice for our kids. Thank you. 
Nikki Gansert. Nikki Gansert. Nikki Gansert. Darlene Demery. Darlene Demery. Darlene Demery. Mr. Dell. Hi, yes. My name is Harry Dell. I teach at Hermitage High School and I, uh, for the last five years, and I taught at Wilder Middle School for nine years previous to that. I'm here to support Dr. Cashwell and uh, her supporting of the first of the four cornerstones, which talks about safety and wellness for all of our, sh our stakeholders. Um, and that's kind of what I want to talk to uh, everybody about, is that um, while I was at Wilder Middle School, I had the devastating and unfortunate experience of attending a student's funeral. The student's name was Tariq, he died in 2012. I still have this, the program from his funeral. He was not well, he was sick, um, but he was amazing. And um, he had been sick for years. He, he, um, he had this great personality though. He was so outgoing, he just could not help but being drawn to this child. He loved to dance, he loved to sing. At the Black Wax Museum that we held every year during uh, Black History Month in, uh, at the school, he, he, was, uh, he portrayed Marvin Gaye. <laughs> and, um, but next year he got sicker and he passed away. And I had to go to his funeral. And you don't want to have anything to do with that. This program stayed on my bedside table for a year after he passed. I can't do that again. I support Dr. Cashwell. You cannot understand what you're asking us to do to watch kids die. And if you have a hotel for, for teachers to, or uh, employees to stay in, you're admitting that some will get sick. And if some will get sick, some will die. 140,000 people in this country have died so far. Okay? And we've been mostly protecting our students since March 13th. They've been hidden at home. Studies have come out saying that kids 10 to 18 get sick. Mr. Dell, thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you. that. Again, on behalf of my peers, I just want to say personally, thank each of you for, first and foremost, your presence today, because we do understand um, the advocacy that you all are expressing on behalf of your families as well as our community. And again, we appreciate your presence.